Grace and Peace. This is New Testament video 66, Matthew, lesson 61. We'll begin Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this time of study. Bless this time of study. Thank you for another day of grace. Give us insight here. May this edify, encourage, and enlighten. And we give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor that you alone deserve. In Christ's name, with thanksgiving, amen. Matthew chapter 20. Now, we concluded our last study video with Matthew chapter 19, verse 30. And I said we would withhold our comments, most of our comments about Matthew 19, 30, until we get to Matthew 20. Because Matthew 19, 30 leads into chapter 20, the first 16 verses. So, the only way to explain Matthew 19, 30 is to have Matthew 20, the first 16 verses, as well. And that's why I said, well, we'll hold Matthew 19, 30 for next time. Well, here's the next time. So, Matthew 19, 30. We will start this study in Matthew 19, 30 and read through to chapter 20, verse 16. Okay, so a lot of verses to read through, and then we'll come back and comment. So Matthew 19, 30. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Matthew 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour, and saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour, and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle, and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired, about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured, complained, against the goodman of the house, saying, these last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them, and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. So this parable here, the parable of the workers in the vineyard, it's exclusive, it's unique to Matthew's Gospel record. We don't find it anywhere else in the Bible. The issue here is service, not salvation. The issue here is service. And you will notice Matthew 19.30 and Matthew 20.16 are quite similar, aren't they? They're, they're like bookends. They're bookends 
one to introduce the parable and one to conclude the parable. Listen, Matthew 19.30. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Now 16 of chapter 20. So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. Okay. The issue here is surface. Surface. Now, as chapter 20 opened the word for at the beginning of 20 verse 1, that is Jesus' response to Peter's question in 19.27. So, Matthew 19.27 then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And then the Lord Jesus Christ speaks of the millennium, the kingdom, and the reward that the members of the little flock will receive when he returns. Matthew 19, 28. Then Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Then he runs through the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Verse 16 of chapter 20, So the last shall be first, and the first last, for many be called, but few chosen. So this issue of service, this issue of reward and service here, the four of Matthew 20 verse 1 connects to chapter 19. What a reversal here! Many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And then 16 of chapter 20, So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. What a reversal! The first or last, and the last are first. The last are first, the first are last. Many are called, few chosen. The, this parable here, it involves the kingdom of heaven. Remember, that's God's earthly kingdom. That's the kingdom that Jesus Christ will establish when he returns. Remember, as of Matthew 20, the kingdom is delayed. Jesus Christ is headed to Calvary's cross. He's not headed to David's throne. Okay. So, I have my nice timeline drawn. I erased the old one after having it for so many lessons. <laughs> so... I've added some more details, and hopefully those details aren't distracting. We're not going to get into those new details anyway, but it, it, it adds some further information on the timeline. If, if I do need to point it out, I can. Okay. But here we are in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Christ's earth of ministry. They are looking forward to the day when he will set up his kingdom on the earth. That kingdom's delayed because first he's going to the cross. But he will return, and we can see that with a completed Bible now, how there are two comings of Christ, and actually they're separated by a period of time here. Our dispensation of grace, our dispensation interrupted. It split those two comings. There's a first coming, the sufferings of Christ, the second coming, and the glory that should follow. This parable of the kingdom of heaven, known here as the laborers in the vineyard, this parable here speaks to that millennium and the reward that accompanies it for the little flock, Israel's believing remnant. So listen. Matthew 20, verse 1. For the Kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. Remember, a parable, parabole, means to throw alongside. In other words, this is, this is a, a, a simile, a meta, metaphorical device here. See this? The kingdom of heaven is like this. 
The kingdom of heaven is like to a man that is a householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. The householder here, that's, that's God, the householder. He goes out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. The vineyard. Who or what is the vineyard? Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah 5. Verse 1, Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved, touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill, and he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. Look down to verse 7. For the vineyard of the Lord, Isaiah 5, 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah his pleasant plant, and he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a crime. So, the vineyard of Matthew 20, verse 1, is the nation Israel. Isaiah interpreted that for us. We don't, we don't have to guess and wonder. What is the vineyard? Who's the vineyard? This is Almighty God. He's sending out Jesus Christ. Father God is looking for laborers. Father God is looking for laborers in Israel's midst. Okay. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. Remember, this is all in light of that coming kingdom at the close of Matthew 19. So this parable is applicable to this time out here in the future. Daniel's 70th week. Is not Christ's earthly ministry. It's not the dispensation of grace. It's out into the future. In preparation for that kingdom of God coming on the earth, God goes out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. See, these are workers. Okay? This, is, this is not salvation. This is service, work. You see now, once they do trust Christ, then they can serve. The issue here though, it's not salvation, it's service. Matthew 20, 16, For many be called, but few chosen. The word chosen there. Elect is another word. Elect and chosen. They're synonymous in the Bible. That's referring to service. Now, of course, the Calvinists, Calvinists would claim that the saved are the elect. The elect does not refer to salvation. The elect, election in the Bible refers to service. Chosen refers to service. Let, 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 me, let me point that out. Uh, but before... We move along. Isaiah 42, listen, 42. Uh, you see, Calvinistic theology, the vain speculations of lost people, or the vain speculations of saved people thinking like lost people, they say that God chooses some people for heaven. And he chooses others for hell. Election. They're the elect. Because God's chosen them to be saved. Hmm. To be saved from hell. Well, look at Isaiah 42.1. Isaiah 42.1. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth, I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Go to Matthew chapter 12. That's Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ is God the Father's servant there. God the Father's elect. Uh-oh! That meant Jesus Christ was going to die and go to hell. Go suffer in hell, huh? No, that that's not what's going on. Service. Isaiah 42.1 says, Service. Servant. Elect. Elect and service. Elect. And servant, they're synonymous. Okay. It's the same idea with chosen. Chosen. Come to Romans. Romans chapter 9. Romans 9, 11. For the children being not yet born neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. That's Genesis 25. The elder shall serve the younger. Election in the Bible is service. Being chosen there is for service. God wants all members of the nation Israel to be his servants. After all, in Genesis chapter 12, come to Genesis chapter 12, the Abrahamic covenant. Why did God form the nation Israel? Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless him that bless thee, and curse him that cursed thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. God wants to make the nation Israel to be his servant nation. Israel... however, is a group of sinners. Okay? They can't serve Almighty God, Jehovah God, until their sins are dealt with. Now, if you come over to Isaiah, come over to Isaiah 45 now. Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 24. Isaiah 45, 24. Surely shall one say, In the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come. And all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. See, Israel's problem is, just like any group of sinners today, they're all biologically related to Adam. Sinners. Isaiah 45 says, Israel, sinners and Adam. Every, every person who comes in this world, comes into this world, is in Adam. Israel's problem is she's in Adam. Look at Romans 5. They have Adam's identity. Just like before we come to Christ, we have Adam's identity. We're in Adam. But in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, we read, But if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. There's a new identity in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. It's the same with the nation Israel. Israel needs to be in Christ, in the Lord, because the alternative is being Adam and go to hell. Eternal judgment. Israel needs to be in the Lord. They need to share His identity. They need to share Jesus Christ's identity. What is Jesus Christ's identity? 
we just read in Isaiah 42, 1. God's servant, God's elect. Once individual Israelites in the prophetic program trust Jesus Christ, the gospel of the kingdom, then they become members of God's family. They're, they're, they're in the little flock. They're in the Lord. Israel shall be saved in the Lord. Israel will have righteousness in the Lord. They will share his identity. They will be chosen in Christ as servants. Just like, look at this verse. Here's another one the Calvinists twist. Ephesians 1 verse 4. Ephesians 1 verse 4. Even as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. We have been chosen not to be in Christ, which is how the Calvinists would read it. We aren't chosen to be in Christ. We haven't been chosen to be in Christ. We've been chosen in Christ. God chose to use people in Christ to be his servants. You see, election, choosing in the Bible is service. God saves people and then those saved people are chosen for service. It's not he chose them for salvation. No, he chose them for justification. No, he chose them for eternal life. No. See, because then you run the risk of precluding, eliminating man's free will. Well, man didn't choose God. God chose man. The Christian didn't choose God. God chose the Christian. See? No. God doesn't choose people to be Christians. God doesn't choose people to be members of the body of Christ. But he has chosen those people who are Christians, those people who are members of the body of Christ, he's chosen them for service. Okay. Well, just like the church, the body of Christ is in Christ, not in Adam. We share Christ's identity, Romans 5. We're justified, sanctified, we have eternal life, and so on. Whereas we were damned and cursed, condemned sinners in Adam. It's the same way with the nation Israel. The nation Israel has to be in Christ too. It's a corporate issue. Okay? Israel has to corporate, corporately be, nationally be, in Christ. Or she can't be God's servants. Just like if we're not in Christ, we can't be God's servants. Okay. So, the, the nation Israel, the little flock, and the church, the body of Christ, they're all in Christ. They all share his identity. They're all redeemed. They're all sanctified. They're all forgiven. They're all qualified to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in their respective places. The body of Christ in the heavenly places, the nation Israel in the earth. Okay. So Matthew chapter 20 now. The Lord Jesus Christ, he is interested in having laborers in Israel. He wants workers in the nation Israel. Now, first they have to come to him by faith. Well, they've already come to him by faith in the close of chapter 19 there. There's the little flock. There are the 12 apostles. They've come to Jesus Christ by faith. Well, now there's a, there's a reward. Okay, so it's... In light of the little flock participating in service, that they receive a reward. Now, like I said, the parable of Matthew 20, verse 1 to 16, actually applies beyond our day, out into the future. Daniel's 70th week. What immediately precedes the second coming of Christ to set up that kingdom. So, we have some labors, we have some saints in the nation Israel after our dispensation closes, and they're working. 
their laboring, they will have a reward. And that's going to be Matthew chapter 20 here. So Matthew chapter 20 verse 1. We have some laborers working in the vineyard. In other words, they're doing the work of the ministry in their nation Israel. They're doing their work in the nation Israel. In their own nation. And they agree the laborers agree with the householder here. They agree, we'll labor for a penny a day. And he sends him out into his vineyard. Go, do the work of the ministry. Remember, these are saints in Israel, members of the little flock, doing the work of the ministry. They're in, in the vineyard. They're working the will of Almighty God in the nation Israel. In other words, they're preaching the gospel of the kingdom and they're getting other people saved. They're teaching sound Bible doctrine. Okay, I'll pay you a penny a day. And they agree. He had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day. He sent them into his vineyard. Okay. Now, don't interpret this as an American, if you are an American. Don't, don't think of, oh, he's just going to pay them one cent a day. What a cheapskate. This is, this is not the United States penny. This, this penny here, the, the, the Greek is the, denarius. denarius okay? The penny here, this is the typical day's wages of this time, 2,000 years ago in Israel. The penny, the denarius. And he went, Matthew 20, verse 3, and he went out about the third hour. So, in, there's, a, there's a schedule, if you notice. There's a, there's a schedule. He goes out at particular times to recruit help. And we, since, since this doesn't apply to us, we're not sure how this schedule translates how this applies to the tribulation period, Daniel's seventh week. We're not sure, but there is certainly timing involved. This isn't just haphazardness. There's some timing involved. The passage to whom, <laughs> the people to whom this passage applies, when they are alive, when their program is running out in the future, they will understand what's going on here. So we don't have to get bogged down in not understanding this timeline. But see Matthew 20 verse 1, it says, The householder, he went out early. That would be early in the morning. Out, he went out early in the morning. Now, in verse 3, it says, About the third hour he went out again and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. The third hour would be 9 in the morning. So, we can assume early in the morning of verse 1, the first time he went out, well, that would have been, what, perhaps sunrise, somewhere between sunrise and nine in the morning. So the third hour, he goes out nine in the morning and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. No work. The marketplace here, it wasn't a place where you'd simply go and shop. It was also a place <laughs> where employers would come shopping for employees. They were looking for help. Okay, like uh, the marketplace here was like the unemployment office. Okay. Matthew 20, verse 4. And the householder goes and tells them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Now he didn't say, I'll give you a penny. He just said, whatever's right 
I'll, I'll pay your salary. What, I'll be fair. And they, they, they go. See, no argument. Just like those earlier. I'll pay you a penny a day. No argument. They just win. Okay, with these, they didn't even get a salary set. Numerically there. He just said, go out and work and I'll pay what is fair. I'll give you what is right. So they go their way. Again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour. So at noon, he finds some more help. And at 3 p.m., he finds more help. So the, the day is, is progressing. And he did likewise. Matthew 20, verse 5. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle. They've been waiting almost the whole day. No work. Nobody has hired them. And he says unto them, uh, Matthew 20, verse 6, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. Now, this right here, whatsoever is right, that ye shall receive. The modern versions just eliminate that. So, you can't teach here what I'm about to teach. As in verse 4, so it is in verse 7. Again, he tells them, whatsoever is right, that ye will receive. See, he, he, he's not setting a numerical value on the wages like he did earlier. A penny. He didn't tell these people at the third hour. He didn't tell the people at the sixth hour, the ninth hour, the eleventh hour. That's 5 p.m., by the way. He didn't tell them, I'll give you a penny. He told the earliest ones he'd give them a penny. So you have more laborers coming after the, the earliest ones went out. You'll get a penny. The, the earliest ones will get, get paid the penny. The third hour workers, the sixth hour workers, the ninth hour workers, the eleventh hour workers, they're just told, go, and I'll pay you your fair share. Nobody here is arguing about anything. They're simply going. And these ones who haven't been told a, a particular amount, they are simply trusting their boss to pay them exactly what he owes them. They're going to walk by faith. They haven't been told you'll, have a, you'll be paid a penny. They're simply under the impression they're walking by faith. The, the boss will pay us what he owes us. So Matthew 20, verse 8. So when even was come. So let, let, let me repeat. This is how the day has progressed. The householder went out early in the morning. He hired laborers for his vineyard. He says, I'll pay you a penny a day. And they go out and they work. No argument. The third hour. Now that would be nine in the morning. He hires some others. He says, go out into the vineyard, I'll pay you what's right. And they go their way, no argument. The sixth hour, noon, the ninth hour, 3 p.m., he finds additional laborers. He sends them out, I'll pay you what's right. At the eleventh hour, that's 5 p.m., he found more help. He says, go, I'll pay you what's right. And they go without argument. Now, the day is ended. And the Mosaic Law said, pay the farmers at the end of the day. Because they're so poor anyway, they need to be paid. So at the end of the day, Matthew 20, verse 8. So when even was come, now it's after 5 p.m. And if you look at verse 12, 2012. They've worked but an hour. The ones who were hired at the 11th hour have worked but one hour. Which means even was come is 6 p.m. That's the 12th hour. 
So it's 6 p.m. Matthew 20, verse 8. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. See that? Many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And then 16. So the last shall be first, and the first last. Many are called, but few chosen. Beginning from the last unto the first. Matthew 20, verse 9. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, so he hired them last, but he pays them first. And the ones whom he hired first, he pays them last. So the order is reversed. He hired them one way, and he pays them the opposite way. Matthew 20, verse 9. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. Ah! Horrors! And when they had received it, they murmured against the good men of the house. Oh, we, we were cheated. Verse 12. Saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. So, the ones who were hired first, they're paid last, which means they were lingering around and saw what the latter workers were paid. Oh, they got a penny. They just worked a part of a day. They worked an hour of the day. And yet they're paid the same amount we are, and we've worked the whole day. We've been shafted. We should receive more. We've worked more. Matthew 20 Verse 13. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Yes. The answer is yes. We had agreed that you would work for me for a penny a day. Now that I've given you what we had already arranged. You now say I've cheated you. No, 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 no. I haven't cheated you. You're cheating me. You're changing the already established salary. The salary was fixed and you agreed to do that work there for a denarius. You've been paid the denarius, but now you've been looking at what others have been paid. You're envious, greedy. I want more. But you had already agreed that that is the amount you'd receive. So they are now changing the contract. We should be paid more. In other words, if the ones who were hired at the 11th hour and they worked but one hour, they were paid a denarius. Well, we should be paid a denarius an hour too. You owe us several denarii. No. The goodman of the house says, No, take that thine is, verse 14, and go thy way. All I owe you is a denarius. All I owe you is one penny. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil, because I am good? An evil eye there, that, that evil eye is covetousness and envy. 
Greed. I have paid the laborers. It's my money. I can do what I want with it. So I don't have to pay you more than what I've already agreed to give you. Nobody has been mistreated here. Everyone has been treated fairly. The goodman of the house, the boss, has paid each of his laborers, each of the workers, a fair amount. He's done no wrong. What we can gain out of this, look at Matthew 20, verse 16. So the last shall be first, and the first last, for many be called, but few chosen. So the last shall be first, and the first last. There's equality here. Nobody's being shafted. All these servants have been treated fairly. Service for Jesus Christ, whether in Israel's program or our program, it's not about the quantity Look, I've done so much more than others. I deserve more. It's not so much the quantity. It's not the quantity of the service. It's the quality of the service. It's not how long you've done the work of the ministry, but rather what was the heart attitude, what was the motivation behind that work of the ministry in which you've participated, my friend? If you go to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, that's present or absent from the body, we may be accepted of him. The physical body here. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in Preposition is in, the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. It's not the things done by his body. The things done in his body. There's some good done in his body, and there's some bad done in his body. What's the good done in the body, and what's the bad done in the body? You see, again, we don't have to wonder. Study. Compare verses. Just like there's a reward system for Israel in the prophetic program, there's a reward system in the mystery program for us, members of the church, the body of Christ. Come over to Colossians. You'll see it. Colossians 3.23. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily. Heartily. See, it's the attitude as to the Lord and not unto men. It's not a competition. It's not to see who can outdo somebody else. That's doing it unto men. To receive the applause, the thank you. Is that why you're doing the work of the ministry? For people to laud you and to worship you? Or are you doing it Heartily to the Lord, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. There's something good, and there's something bad. See that there? There's something wrong. 
and there's something right. We will receive the reward of the inheritance. The inheritance, like in Ephesians 1, the inheritance is the heavenly realm for us. The inheritance for Israel, that's the earthly realm. The reward of the inheritance is the function, the job, that we will have in the inheritance. The reward of the inheritance. There's a reward. There will, there will be jobs for Israel's little flock to do in the millennium. Reigning, in other words, we covered that. Ruling over the, the, the twelve apostles, for example, ruling over the twelve tribes of Israel. But in the book of Luke, you can see the, the, the believing Jews ruling over Gentiles based on the service that they rendered to the Lord. There are also offices of government in the heavenly places. Satan has to follow them. Just like unbelievers have defiled the offices of government on the earth today, God will purge them, put Israel, Israel's little flock, believing Israel, redeemed Israel, in those offices of government. So the Lord Jesus Christ will one day reign in the heavenly places. He will purge Satan and his angels from the heavenly places. That's Revelation 12. And he will install us, the church, the body of Christ. Now, whether it's a, it's a role, a job, a function in Israel's earthly kingdom or the body of Christ's heavenly kingdom, that job, that role depends on what type of doctrine that we stored in our inner man. What type of doctrine did Israel store in their inner, inner man? Okay. The judgment seat of Christ is when the church, the body of Christ, stands before Jesus Christ individually. We give an account to the Lord. When we are removed from the earth, and I'm glad I drew these little arrows now so I don't have to draw them. <laughs> so, when we, the church, the body of Christ, are removed, the rapture, we've been caught up into the third heaven. Now, the prophetic program can resume on the earth. It was paused before we came in. It can now resume, now that we're gone. We go to the third heaven. And we're going to stand before Jesus Christ and we'll give an account as for our service. And based on that service, then there's a position. Thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, mights, dominions, every name that's named, that's Ephesians 1, that's Colossians 1. The, the, the heavenly places, the offices of government, Ephesians 2, and those, those passages. First uh, Corinthians, First Corinthians 3. It's not how much we've done for the Lord, how long we've labored for the Lord, and, and there are so many, hopefully well-meaning Christians, I've done so much for years and years for the Lord, and look how dedicated I am. But you know what? There is a high chance there. There's a good chance that that's worth us before Jesus Christ. Why do I say that? What about somebody who served the Lord 50 years in ministry? I have visited 200 countries and I've preached the gospel and I've taught thousands of seminary students and I led a, 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 a million souls to Jesus. I did this, I did that. How nice. Now listen to this. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10, uh, 9. 
1 Corinthians 3, 9, For we are laborers together with God, you are God's husbandry, you are God's building, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed, beware how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be re revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he shall build thereupon, if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. Yet so is by fire. Our service for the Lord is not based on how much service it was, how long it was. Remember, like, the parable of the workers in the vineyard. What the Lord Jesus is interested in seeing here is, what is the quality of the service? Now, how does he determine at the judgment seat of Christ, how will he determine whether something is good Christian service or bad Christian service. How does he rate? How does he categorize that service? You see, we just we just read how he does it. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. There are six building materials here. And Paul says, be careful, be careful. Let every man take heed. Why take heed? Because there are three building materials that are worthless. It's not all the building materials are good. There are three good materials and three bad. There's the good and the bad. You see, what did 2 Corinthians 5 say? 2 Corinthians 5, remember? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body. What's done in the body? It's the doctrine. The doctrine we put in the inner man. It's not the work that we did with the physical hands and walking with the physical feet. It, it's what is in our inner man. What was motivating us to do the work of the ministry that we did? Was it the flesh? Was it wood, hay, stubble? Was it philosophy? What's the wood, hay, stubble? What's the wood, hay, stubble? That's 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. I have not seen, nor ear hear, nor ear heard, neither hath have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. Wood, hay, stubble. I have not seen, that's the, the eye, empiricism. The scientifically minded, if I can't see it, or I can't smell it, or I can't taste it, or I can't hear it, or I can't touch it, it's not real, I don't believe in it, I don't believe in sky daddies and fairy tales, an old man sitting on a rocking chair in heaven. See the, see the, see the ignor, ignoramuses and the skeptical ranks there, neither nor ear heard. Tradition, church tradition, things that have been passed down to you. Neither have entered into the heart intuition. So we have, we have the philosophy, we have the, the science here, we have the traditionalists, we have the the, the, the heart searchers, the soul searchers, those who, who, who seek to find enlightenment. 
by searching their hearts. Self-enlightenment. If it's philosophy undergirding your Christian service, my friend, if you are building your Christian life on philosophy and church tradition, and science, and intuition, speculations, hallucinations, assumptions, presumptions, and usually that's what people are basing their Christian life on and their Christian service on. You know what that is? Zip hole, not a nothing. Wood hay stubble. It's burned up. Psh, amounts to nothing. So they could have labored in the ministry for 50 years. What was the quality of the doctrine, though, that was motivating them? And what was the quality of the doctrine that they were sharing with others? Was it the word of God rightly divided? Was it gold, silver, precious stones? Spiritual wisdom, spiritual knowledge, spiritual understanding? Or was it ignorance? Was it the word of God's grace working in us? Paul's epistles? Or was it Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? And early Acts, and Hebrews to Revelation, and Genesis to Malachi? See, if we're building our Christian life, if we're building our Christian service on the Sermon on the Mount, and the Ten Commandments. You know what that is? That's wood, hay, stubble. That's wood, hay, stubble. See, Paul says here, I have laid the foundation. Now, who's the foundation? Not Peter. It's not Paul either. Paul says, I laid the foundation. Paul's not the foundation. Who's the foundation? 1 Corinthians 1. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 3.11. I was looking at the, the ones in the, in the 11. And it's 1 Corinthians 3.11. For other foundation can no man lay then that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, in Romans 16, Romans 16, 25. Now, to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, see Paul's gospel, Christ died for our sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. My gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Jesus Christ is being preached here according to the revelation of the mystery. Paul, the Apostle Paul, is preaching Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. This is not Jesus Christ according to prophecy. This is not Jesus Christ according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is not Jesus Christ according to early Acts. This is not Jesus Christ according to Hebrews through Revelation. This is Jesus Christ in the mystery program. The mystery was revealed to and then now through the Apostle Paul. And it passes on to us when we read Romans through Philemon. We understand that hidden wisdom of God, that, that, that secret that God kept in himself until one day, and that's Acts 9, the Lord Jesus Christ reached down, saved Saul of Tarsus, made him Paul the Apostle, and commissioned him and said, you go to the, the whole world with this, this new way to look at Jesus Christ. This new way to look at Jesus Christ. Go and tell the whole world about it. He's the head of the body. Christ Jesus is the head of the body of Christ. Okay, so our time is running short. But 1 Corinthians 3.13 The fire shall try every man's work of what quantity it is? No, no preacher. And the fire shall try testing here. Evaluating every man's work of what sort it is. The sort is whether it's gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, stubble. In the physical world, which one is most prevalent? Which ones are the most dominant? Is there, or are there a, a lot of gold, silver, precious stones? No. There's a lot of wood, hay, and stubble in the physical world, huh? That's what, that's what makes the precious stones precious. They're valuable because they're rare. Gold is rare, silver is rare, precious stones are rare. Gold, silver, precious stones. There aren't much of that. Wood, hay, stubble, oh, plenty to go around. Plenty to go around. Well, in the same way in the spiritual world. 
There's plenty of garbage to go around in the spiritual world. Plenty of false teaching to go out in the world. Very little truth. Very little truth. Gold, silver, precious stones is rare. Consequently, you'll see very few people following Paul's ministry and message. There's a lot of wood, hay, and stubble. Most people are not following Paul's epistles. They're following everything else. There's a lot of wood. There's a lot of hay. And there's a lot of stubble. That'll be burned up. The only thing that will survive. Gold, silver, precious stones. The, the, the sound Bible doctrine in the soul. The, the word of God's grace. Motivating Christians. That will survive at the judgment seat of Christ. What will burn up is everything else. Church tradition, poof, that won't amount to anything. No reward for that. To the degree that we let Jesus Christ live his life in and through us now. And see, you can't do that unless you know the word of God rightly divided. Unless you know Paul's ministry and message. To the degree that we let Jesus Christ reign in our hearts now. That's the degree we will reign with him in the heavenly places. So every member of the church, the body of Christ, will make it to heaven. They will have different roles in government, different positions. And just like on the earth today, there are the, all the various jobs have their qualifications. So the thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, mights, dominions, uh, mights, every name that's named, all those positions have qualifications too. We gain those qualifications, that information, by studying the Word of God rightly divided, especially Pauline. Doctrine, Romans 3, Philemon. We will receive a reward because the work will survive. The, the gold, silver, precious stones, that will survive. The wood, hay, and stubble, that will be burned. The man will be saved. That's not, oh, he almost went to hell. No, 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 no. This man is a saved man. He's justified. He never, he, he, he never can go to hell. It's not he's saved from hell here. He saved in his edification because the fire burns up the garbage that he put into his soul. And there'll be, there will be plenty of loss of reward. There will be plenty of loss of reward at the judgment seat of Christ because there's so much tradition in our minds as Christians. So much church tradition, speculation, philosophy, nonsense, silliness fleshliness that we've never gotten away from. With the judgment seat of Christ, the Lord will not allow any of that garbage to pollute heaven. So he's going to purge every Christian's soul there of doctrine. That's, that's, that's not the word of God right, divided. He's going to cleanse. He's going to burn up. He's going to wash all these Christians' souls that have that garbage information. And it'd be every Christian soul. Every Christian soul to some degree will have nonsense that needs to be removed from it. Otherwise, it'll pollute the heavenly places. So, okay, let's just get back to Matthew 20 because time is running here. So Matthew 20, verse 16. So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. For many be called, but few chosen. For many be called, but few chosen. If you have a modern English version, you don't have that expression. So you can't teach what I'm about to teach you here. For many be called, but few chosen. In a King James Bible, there it is. For many be called, but few chosen. Many are called. God calls all Jews. 
They should be a kingdom of priests. All the Jews should be his servants. Many are called, but few chosen. They are not responding. Most of them are not responding by faith. So they can't be chosen. See, if they would respond by faith, then he can choose them. He can select them to be his servants. Now, he wants them to be his servants. He wants the whole nation Israel to be his servant nation. But there are many unbelievers. And they'll be the ones that put him on the cross. Not too long from now. There are many unbelievers in Israel. They don't want. They're not interested. They refuse to be God's servant nation. They're doing their own thing. They've turned everyone into their own way, like sheep gone astray. Isaiah 53, verse 6. Sin, sinners. I, 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 I. Just like Lucifer. Pride. We want to do what we want to do. We don't want to submit to the Creator's will. We don't want to submit to the Jehovah God who called our fathers out of their paganism, like Abraham, for example, such as Abraham. Many be called, but few chosen. The ones who are chosen, that's those who come to faith in Christ, then they're chosen. Many could be God's servants, but only a few in Israel. It's a little flock, a remnant. Only a few care to be his servants. Many be called, but few chosen. He calls them by the gospel of the kingdom, but they don't want to come. Only a few. So Matthew 20, 17, And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests, and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock, and to scourge, and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. Remember back in Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16, 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. First time he talks about Calvary openly. There it is. I'm going to Jerusalem, not to reign. I have to go to Jerusalem. Why? To die. Suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. On the Mount of Transfiguration, chapter 17, Moses and Elijah, they speak about the Son of Man dying. And that's in the book of Luke, chapter 9. His decease, the Son of Man, has to die. And Matthew 17, 9, the Son of Man must be risen again. Then Matthew 17, 22, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And the third day he shall be raised again. So we're, we're within the last six months of Christ's earthly ministry. Here he is again. He speaks of his death, coming death there. Matthew 20, verse 17, 18 and 19. So come to Mark chapter 10. Mark 10, you can put a marker in Matthew 20. Mark 10, come to Mark 10. Mark 10, see how Mark 10 presents it? 
10, 28. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake, and the gospels, gospel of the kingdom. But he shall receive an hundredfold. Now in this time, houses, and brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, with persecutions, and in the world to come eternal life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last first. See, that parable was skipped there. Mark doesn't present it. Matthew is unique. 32. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem. They're headed to Jerusalem. And Jesus went before them. And they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto them, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit on him. They'll spit upon him and shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. He's adding more information. They'll scourge me. They'll mock me. They'll spit on me. See, he's at, every time he mentions the cross at this point, he's adding further details. I'm going to come over to Luke 18. Watch this, Luke 18. Here's a shocker. Luke 18, 31. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spitted on, and they shall scourge him and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. Note verse 34. Luke 18, 34. And they understood none of these things, and this saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. How plain! I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to die. They'll mistreat me. They'll spit on me. They'll scourge me. I'll be betrayed. And it says, they don't understand. This saying was hid from them, neither did they know these things were spoken. After his resurrection, John 20 verse 9, they didn't believe he would resurrect. They weren't expecting him to resurrect. They weren't at the tomb waiting for him to resurrect. No, they were going to anoint the body. They assumed he was still dead. I say all of that, my friend, to point out the fact that once again, there's more than one gospel in the Bible. There's only one gospel today. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. Faith in that and that alone will have eternal life. That's not what they were expected to believe. They weren't preaching his death, his burial, and his resurrection as sufficient payment for their sins. Why? One, he, didn't, he hadn't died yet. And two, when he would tell them, like in Matthew 16, we didn't read that. We did when we were in Matthew 16 a while back. Peter argued, not so. Won't happen to you, Lord. You're not going to die. And they argued. Okay? They didn't say, praise the Lord. You're going to die for our sins. This saying is hid from them. They don't understand. They don't know what was spoken. So why was it? Why did Jesus Christ even speak about it then? If they, they didn't get it, why did he even tell them? It's to show us. He knew what was coming. It's not going to take him by surprise. Father God is not going to be taken by surprise. Jesus Christ will not be shocked. Huh, they don't receive me. They're going to put me on the cross. Never expected that. He did expect it. And he knows it's coming. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. It's impending. It's looming. The cross of Christ is only about a week away. In Matthew 20, right here. Maybe a little more than a week. 
by the time you get to the opening of chapter 21, it's less than a week. I know it's coming. I will be betrayed. Matthew 20, 18. We're going to Jerusalem. I'm not sitting on David's throne. Not yet. I have to go to Calvary's cross. The Son of Man, he should be reigning. He should be taking Adam's place in the earth as God's king. No, he's been rejected. He has to go to Jerusalem to die. He will be betrayed unto the chief priests and scribes. His most trusted apostle, his best friend, will turn him over to these apostate religious leaders of Israel. The chief priests and the scribes, the chief priests, the religious leaders of Israel, the scribes, the Bible teachers, the Bible copiers, the educated crowd, the literate crowd. And you know what? Worldly education is all they have. False religion is all they have. And now they're going to put the Son of God on the cross like a common criminal. They will mock him. They will mock him. They will make fun of him. They will spit, spit on him. They'll punch him. They'll ridicule him. They'll, they'll accuse him of all sorts of things. They will insult him. They will abuse him. They will whip him. They will mistreat him. And he, this is, this is the, the most mind-boggling part of it all, he will allow them to do that to him. He's, he will not resist them. He will not fight against them. He will not avoid it. It's my Father's will, not my will, but His be done. The cross is my Father's will. Hebrews 10, I've come to do thy will. You don't want sacrifice and burnt offerings. Those can't take away sin. You want me to die, Father God, and shed my sinless blood for these most pathetic creatures who deserve nothing but wrath. And yet I'll go. I don't deserve this. I could have stayed in heaven and forgotten about them entirely. Let them go their merry own way to hell. That's, that's what Jesus Christ could have done. That's what Father God could have done, my friend. Just let the whole human race go to the lake of fire forever. Every sinner go That's not what he chose to do, though. That Father God didn't choose that. And Jesus Christ didn't choose that. So Christ is making his way to Jerusalem. He left Galilee at the opening of chapter 19, verse 1 there. He left Galilee after two and a half years. He's come down south now, north of the Dead Sea, east of the Jordan River, conducting his Perean ministry. And we have a few minutes left, so let me just put this. So for two and a half years, from Matthew 4, verse 12, all the way to the end of Matthew 18, into chapter 19, Jesus Christ leaves Galilee, crosses the Jordan, he's traveling southward, and he's in this area right here, somewhere here, east of the Jordan River, just north of the Dead Sea. He's making his way to Jerusalem. 
See, little by little, he's making his way to choose him. He's going to go like this, and this is where he is right now. He's going to go like this. Okay. The triumphal entry, riding on the donkey, will come in chapter 21, which will be coming up soon. Not the next lesson, but the one after. So these religious leaders, they don't really believe in the heart. They're Old Testament scriptures. They have a head knowledge. They know Messiah is coming. But it's, again, it's intellectualism. And they don't see Jesus as fulfillment. Of all those hundreds of prophecies in their own Bible. In John 7, and this is prior to Matthew 20, the Pharisees and the chief priests send officers to try to arrest Jesus. They're not successful. Now we'll see. Israel's religious leaders, they will be upset. They will grow irritated to find children in the Jerusalem temple praising the Lord Jesus. Once he rides that donkey and he goes into the temple. Oh, they can't stand it that he's being praised. And see, the focus is not on the religious leaders of Israel, but on the king of Israel. And, and they're, they're envious. They want the kingdom for themselves. They want the nation for themselves. They don't want Jesus Christ reigning over them. These chief priests will have the audacity to ask. Jesus, what are you doing here in the temple? What authority do you have? They're con continually conniving how to take his life. Judas will go and for 30 pieces of silver. He'll contract to betray. He'll turn over Jesus to them. And the chief priests and scribes, they'll be waiting in a be gang, be a gang there. They'll They'll lie about Jesus Christ. They'll take counsel how to put him to death. They'll send him to Pontius Pilate. They'll falsely accuse him. He'll say nothing. They will per persuade the multitude. Choose the criminal. Barabbas. And destroy Jesus. Let the criminal live. And kill the sinless son of God. And see, it says, they will deliver him to the Gentiles. They will, the Jews, will recruit the non-Jews' help. See, the Jewish mode of execution was stoning. But prophecy didn't say Jesus would be stoned to death. Prophecy, Bible prophecy, Psalm 22. His hands and feet will be pierced. That's crucifixion. That's the Roman the Gentile mode of execution there. So he'll be crucified, not stoned to death. He'll be crucified. See, Bible prophecy, and they don't even know they're fulfilling it. They're going to conspire with the Gentiles, just like Acts 2 said they would do. The Jews are conspiring to put their own Messiah to death. They're conspiring with the Gentiles, scheming with the Gentiles, cooperating with the Gentiles. Acts 4 no matter what happens to him, though, Matthew 20, 19, he always says, the third day, I'll rise again. They can put me to death. That's fine. I'll be back. I'll live again. And I'll still reign. And I'll fulfill the rest of prophecy. My timeline is blocked. I've come to die here to fulfill prophecy. I'm coming back here to reign to fulfill prophecy there too. Okay. So, that's the first lesson of Matthew 20. And now we move on to second lesson, final lesson. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this study. Thank you for the enlightenment as we conclude now, Matthew. May this have a fine courage and lighten it.